Let's talk about focus and concentration and how you can improve your focus and concentration using science-based protocols. So what I want you to imagine is an arrow. And an arrow, of course, has an arrow head and it has the shaft of that arrow. The neurochemical system that really represents the shaft of that arrow, right, the straight line, is epinephrine, also called adrenaline. The release of epinephrine from those two locations overall increases energy, it increases alertness. It does not alone increase focus. So we're going to need epinephrine in the equation. Without epinephrine, there is no focus or concentration. Now the arrow head is going to be represented or related to the mechanisms of acetylcholine. And the best way to think about it is it's like a spotlight. It highlights specific neurons, nerve cells, that should be active or more active, I should say, than the other neurons in the environment. So the reason I've assigned the arrowhead to acetylcholine and acetylcholine to the arrowhead is that if you have an arrow with a very big arrowhead that's really broad, really blunt, imagine a mile wide arrowhead, that's not very focused on any one location. It's not really pointing to any one location, is it? But with a narrow, really tightly focused arrowhead, well, that's focused on one location. In order to have ongoing focus, we need another neurochemical. And it turns out that that third neurochemical is dopamine, sort of an engine that keeps that focus moving forward, right? Because we don't just wanna be focused for a moment, we want to be able to focus for 10 minutes or for an hour, or maybe even for two hours. One of the most important things to build and maintain your focus and concentration is to optimize your sleeping behavior. That is to get enough quality sleep, I would say 80% of the nights of your life. Sleep has been shown to relate to cognitive performance, physical performance, hormone output, and so many other things, including immune system function. What we can reliably say is that sleep modulates just about every process in your brain and body. So you have to get great sleep. There's simply no tool that's going to allow you to overcome chronic sleep deprivation and allow you to remain focused. No pill, no device, no supplement, no protocol whatsoever. 40 Hertz binaural beats have been shown in a number of peer-reviewed studies to increase focus and concentration. There are quality peer-reviewed studies supporting the idea that white noise or pink noise and believe it or not, there is something called pink noise. It has to do with the specific frequencies of sound that are in the noise. Well, white noise and pink noise have been shown to not improve concentration per se, but to improve people's ability to transition into concentrated states. These are tools that really have been shown over and over in humans to allow people to focus with more depth and to decrease the transition time into focus. This is a really key point. A lot of people are challenged with getting into a mode of focus. None of us, however, should be expected to just sit down and drop directly into a state of focus. I think that's completely an unfair request of ourselves. I mean, for instance, you wouldn't expect yourself to go out on the track or go out for a run and not warm up. You might jog for a few minutes or even walk before you would jog and then jog before you would run, right? I would hope you would do that. It's very important to understand mental work, focus and concentration as requiring that warm up. What is that warm up? Well, you know what that warm up is. That warm up is the ramping up or the increase of epinephrine, adrenaline, acetylcholine and dopamine. Right. The way that neurochemicals work is we don't just get to flip switches in our brain because we decide to. There's a gradual dropping into any state, whether or not that state is sleep, right? You go from shallow sleep to deep sleep and then out eventually. Focus two, you go from shallow focus to increasingly deep focus. That is in our metaphor of the arrow, it's very broad. It's pointed at a lot of things. And over time, as we drop into focus, that arrow is narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. In fact, probably better to, to think about it narrowing and then sometimes oscillating and getting wider again. You know, we might hear something down the hallway or more typically our phone will buzz or we'll think, oh, I wonder what so-and-so is doing or I hadn't contacted them about something. By understanding that it's dynamic, by understanding that you are going to be continually going in and out of progressively but varying levels of focus, you will greatly release the pressure on yourself to feel focused all the time when you want to be. Our brain and body operate within that day or within each and every day, I should say, 
with 90 minute ultradian cycles. So my suggestion would be anytime you're going to sit down and try and focus, you're going to try and do a focused bout of physical exercise or skill learning or musical learning, or maybe you're even just having a conversation. Maybe you're a therapist or you're attending therapy or a class. How long should it be? And the ideal duration is about 90 minutes, not exactly 90 minutes, but we can reliably say 90 minutes or less. Okay. It doesn't have to be the full 90 minutes, but trying to push yourself to be able to drop into two hours of focus or three hours of focus while possible is not really in line with what we know about the underlying biology. Try and give yourself some time to deliberately decompress, to let your mental states idle, to not be focused on any one thing. That period of idling is essential for your ability to focus, much in the same way that rest between sets of resistance training or rest between exercise is vital to being able to focus and perform during the actual sets or during the actual bouts of running or cycling or whatever uh, your particular form of exercise might be. I can't emphasize this enough. Our ability to focus is not just related to what happens during the entry and movement through those focus bouts, but after those focus bouts, we really need to deliberately decompress. And of course, the ultimate decompress, the time in which we are not directing our thinking and our action is during sleep. And so it's no wonder, or I should say it holds together logically that that deep, long lasting duration of not controlling where our mind is at is in fact the ultimate form of restoration, even if we have very intense dreams. I'm often asked how many ultradian cycles one can perform throughout the day. That depends on how well you've slept, how well you are nourished, which we'll talk about in a moment, and how well trained up your focus capacity is. And here's the paradox. If you are very trained at focusing, if you're very good at dropping into focus, you're actually going to need more deliberate decompression and defocus. And I recommend only doing about two, maybe three deep work sessions per day. So not one 90 minute session, then expecting yourself to do another one, another one, another one, but rather one deep work 90 minute session and maybe another in the afternoon. A lot of people get surprised by this and say, wait, how many people can afford to just work three hours a day? I'm not saying just work three hours a day. I'm really talking about the hard mental work. And again, somewhat paradoxically, the more you can concentrate, the more deeply you can concentrate, the fewer deep work concentration bouts you can actually perform each day. deliberate cold exposure. This is something I've talked about on the podcast before, but deliberate cold exposure can be achieved by getting into a cold shower for one to five minutes. If you're not used to it, you probably want to start with one minute. We know that getting into cold water or under cold water greatly increases epinephrine levels and dopamine levels in the brain and blood. There's a beautiful study that was published in the European Journal of Physiology that showed that the increases in dopamine are massive, you know, a, a near doubling or more of dopamine levels that are very long lasting for hours. And epinephrine and indeed cortisol levels are also increased and in ways that support not just immune system function because they do that, but and mood because it does that, but that can really improve concentration and focus. Epinephrine is a neurochemical that will place your vision into more of a tunnel mode, which will allow you to focus on cognitive work or physical work in a more specific way. You're not gonna be as distractible. And it's very easy to achieve by getting into a cold shower or a cold body of water for a brief period of time. Here's the thing, it should be uncomfortably cold, but safe to stay in for one to five minutes. Okay, so uncomfortably cold that you really want to get out, but safe to stay in. Not so cold that it's going to give you a heart attack and not so warm that it's comfortable that it doesn't create that adrenaline release. Cold water exposure reliably increases epinephrine levels. It is incredibly useful as a tool for this. How long should you do it before a work bout? Well, if you get into really cold water, it's uncomfortably cold and get out after about three minutes, you're probably good to go. Dry off and get to work. Some of you might think this is a little bit silly as a tool for focus and concentration, but if you look at the data on epinephrine and how powerfully it can increase focus, I think you'd be very impressed. I mean, it certainly can increase one's ability to attend to specific visual stimuli. So for reading or math work, et cetera, it's going to be very useful.